Check one, two, two, check one, two. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, just to give you a five-minute warning to get comfortable, sift through your goodie bag, get your questions ready, and we'll start in short round. Do you want to be on the end, or you okay here? Down there. You're next to me, right? No. Oh, really? I'm the anchor down the end. Or... Uh, I think maybe Adam did. I don't know. Come on up.
criticized. Who was it? The drinking water while he's giving a talk. The uh, the, the, uh, the politician who's responding to uh, the State of the Union. Yeah. Well, it wasn't it wasn't that. It was the, he tried to watch the camera and do the thing at the same time. It was just unnatural. Oh, he disappeared for what, three seconds while he was, yeah. Porsche, 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 Porsche. Are we talking about porches? Pontiacs? All right, Jan Brady. <laughs> Porsche, Porsche, Porsche. Exactly. <laughs> Is this the Pontiac form? <laughs> We're in the wrong place. <laughs> All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your diligent timeliness this morning. We have a very full weekend of fun activities ahead of us, and I thank you for joining us. You are in the right room if you're here for the Haggerty's seminar series, and today we are looking under the hood of the Porsche market. So, what are you Atlanta today? <laughs> under the hood of the Porsche market. Today, we've got a fantastic group of panelists who are going to share with you their deep knowledge of Porsches and their opinions and uh, some other insights that they may have for you today. My name is Adam Martin, and I'm the Vice President of the Haggerty Institute. The Haggerty Institute is one of our internal departments that gets to enjoy, look at, work with our collector vehicle data. And one of the best things that we get to produce in conjunction with Dave Penny is the price guide. All of you have an example of this in your gift bag today. You may come in handy this weekend for planning on going to the auctions or checking out what your collection is currently worth. And we'll be referencing this great material throughout the presentation, and you'll see it in some graph form that we have uh, on the display screen in the corners of the room. During the display, uh, or on the display, during our discussion, we're going to have some indexes. We're going to focus on the 356 market. We're going to look at the Carrera market by itself, and then we're going to carve out that anniversary car, the 901, the 911, and talk more in, in detail about its history and growth. After that, uh, or preceding all of that, we're going to get a glance of the blue chip index to understand kind of what the market in general is doing, and then we'll just kind of go in deeper from there. I'm also going to make sure we leave time at the end of the day to be able to ask some great questions of our panelists. So we'll have some microphones um, hosted by some of our Haggerty staff wandering around the white shirt. So if you have a question at the end, please grab their attention, and we'll get the microphone over to you right away, and we'll get the panelists to respond. I want to introduce our panelists, and we'll get underway. Immediately to my left is Mr. Rob Sass. He is the publisher of Haggerty's Magazine. He also freelance writes for the New York Times, Auto Week, and you'll see his stuff in Fox News on a weekly basis. To his left, the infamous and amazing Cam, or I call him 4Cam, Cam Ingram, the co-owner of Road Scholars Restoration Shop. You may have recognized his work from a first-in-class win last year at Pebble Beach, where their facility restored a 1950 Gmund Coupe for Mr. Hans Peter Porsche. So Cam's got some insights today that he'll be looking forward to sharing with you. Next to him is a fantastic friend of mine, Reed, and a longtime Porsche enthusiast based in St. Louis. He started his Porsche passion in his college years and picked up a beautiful little 57 Aqua Marine, correct? Beautiful Aqua Marine Coupe. And since then, his Porsche addiction was seated, and uh, he's built a fantastic service facility, so he has a deep, a deep mind when it comes to service and now sort of restoration, and so Reed's got some tremendous insights to share with us today. 
and the very important and special good friend of mine, Dave Kenny, the publisher of Haggerty's Price Guide. If you have a valuation question this weekend, Dave is one of our best go-to sources and has, uh, well, a fantastic appraisal business. And that's, that's why I'll be hiding all week. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. Let's, let's get this underway and go to our uh, first slide today. Dave, I'm going to go right to you, and let's talk about the big market in general. And this is your blue chip index. Yeah, this is uh, what we call the blue chip, and, and we've highlighted the two uh, Porsche cars on the uh, blue chip in the, uh, in the red, so you can see them there. It's kind of extraordinary. Not too many uh, different types of vehicles get more than one car on this, uh, on this list. Purely subjective. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, Rob came up with, actually, and we kind of spitballed which cars should be on here. Uh, we don't have too many of the really obscure cars on here because we wanted this to be something that was easy to uh, easy to take a look at in terms of uh, you know your your mind's eye. You'd be able to identify a number of the cars. Um, as you can see by that graph, that's going exactly the way that your uh, IRA is not, probably. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, well, it could be that's doing a little better now. But uh, you can see uh, we've got a numeric slide on the, uh, or numeric side on the uh, left hand side of it, and then up to the right. And in the last five and seven years, especially, uh, this, this list has gone up. I could go into some of the reasons why. We think that a lot of people are putting their money into collectibles as opposed to uh, stocks and securities and, of course, real estate, which is now starting to pick up. Um, but it has been, uh, you know, it has been a very, very interesting, uh, really, five-year period here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also have this on, the, uh, on your price guide. It's in the front of the price guide as well. And I just before I forget, uh, you can access all of this at... Uh, Haggerty.com uh, slash valuation tools, the entire uh, what you're going to see here is online uh, in terms of the uh, index. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other thoughts, comments, gentlemen? Or you are good to go. Let's dig right into the 356 market. Rob, what do you think? This is a, a trending graph as well, and we're talking about just the 356s here. Yeah, it's just amazing what's happened in the 356 market in probably, oh, the last three or four years. Virtually any 356 that, that you want to consider owning now is, is probably, I mean, Cam, what's the entry level now? Probably $45,000, $50,000? For, you know, for a T5, for, for a, a B Coupe. Yep, right. Yeah. You know, the car that they made the most of in the 356 series, just tremendous. Probably only just five years ago, you'd be looking at uh, being able to buy a nice T5 coupe in the 30s. That's right. I so. absolutely agree. And everything more desirable at on up. Obviously, we'll talk about the four cam cars in a little bit, but um, $150,000 for an A Speedster not long ago was a lot of money. Now they're breaking $300,000 on a fairly regular basis. So um, just explosive growth in the 356 market right now. Mm -hmm. Reed, your car is in this first category. Do you still have that Aquamarine yeah, 356? Not this thing. One, I, I bought another. I bought another uh, Aquamarine 57 Coupe. Outstanding. Very, I hope you bought before uh, this graph came out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Rob mentioned the Carreras. Let's dig into this market, and um, it's a little bit different of a graph. What do you think there, Reed? What do I think about the Carreras? Yeah. Uh, well, I've got a couple. <laughs> I'm not selling them. So I think they're a great buy. Uh, there aren't any more. Uh, uh, the collectors have finally learned to start mm -hmm. going for them. The, I, what I've seen is people are still afraid of the roller bearing crank, which is nonsense. You're not going to drive it more than two or 3,000 miles a year. And so. But no less than 6,000 RPMs, right? Well, yes, that's okay. basically correct. <laughs> okay. Try driving in traffic with that. It's hard to do. What do you, I'm sorry, Cam, go ahead. No, I don't think there's any doubt that the Speedsters and the Carreras are, will always continue to drive the 356 market in general because they are the iconic, yeah. most desirable of the 356s. That top tier. Yeah. Uh, not long ago, we sort of stuck our necks out and, and looked at, at kind of a five-year picture for uh, for Carrera Speedsters, and 
We postulated that those cars might actually be million dollar cars, not very far down the line. I think any 58 or 59 GT Speedster is already there. Mm -hmm. I, I know for a fact several examples that have sold for seven figures that are GT examples. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So. Amazing growth there. Yeah. We'll have to change the index there. Seven figures. Yeah. Those, those private deals. <laughs> yeah, private deals, that's right. All right. Well, I, I think it's almost like the man of the hour. The 911 is a very, very special car and celebrating a birthday with us uh, this weekend. Rob, I know you have um, a bit of an addiction. I think you said six or seven of these have passed through your garage? Uh, passed through my garage being the <laughs> operative term. I'm the guy who sold a 2.4 liter S and... and uh, uh, 73 and a half uh, CIST, probably at the bottom of the market. So, <laughs> but yeah, again, uh, really, really uh, explosive growth here. Most of it with the the early S's, the 67 to 73 S's, um, have have just uh, done tremendously well in the last four or five years. The the T's and E's. Uh, from the the uh, the 69 to 73 have gone up as well, but the cars that are reliably breaking six figures are, are generally S's, and, and uh, I think Cam is, is pretty in tune to this as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the driving factors for the long, the long hoods is that we have a whole new generation of buyers getting into early 911s, mm -hmm. and it's through Porsche's terrific new product line. A guy that's just bought a GT3 or a new 991, and he's starting to read books, and he gets an experience in an early 911, and he yeah. has to have one. And that's part of the market drive up we see in the early 911s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the other thing that's kind of interesting, too, is, you know, sort of the outlaw phenomenon that we saw, we've saw we seen in the 356 world for a while seems to be spreading to the 911 the market with people backdating later cars to look like long hood cars, get yeah. the Singer cars in... in uh, in Europe that are getting a lot of attention, a lot of press. So what, do you, what do you think of that, Cam? In I terms think we of see so much with social media and younger people, and uh, I'm sure many in the room have seen Magnus's Urban Outlaw video. Mm -hmm. There's such a movement right now for enjoying your car and doing an R-Group car yeah. that it's even what's left out there in the market to consume is getting bought up, whether it be T models, and they're turning them into R-Group cars. Mm -hmm. And that's a big component, not to mention all the cars in the 80s and 90s that were turned into race cars that yeah. were you know, nice rust-free chassis at the time. Yeah. Gotcha. I've got a, maybe a, well, a question. We've called out long hood, and does that mean there's a short hood version? And help me out, what does that really mean? <laughs> when I'm looking at a Porsche, how can I tell? It's just, you know, people seem to invent new shorthand to refer to these cars on a fairly regular basis. and. Long hood just refers to the, the, the original cars, the pre-impact bumper cars that were built from September 1964 when production started until the end of the 1973 model year. The short hood cars start in 1974 with the five-mile-an-hour impact, five impact bumpers. Okay, I like that. And then the outlaw version, or the R group, this is where an enthusiast can maybe take some liberties with their car and customize it a little bit. Is that what we're talking about? Absolutely. Just like the outlaw movement in 356 is where people are customizing their cars to their preferred taste. Okay. And you now residual value wise, that's a tricky proposition because you have to find the next buyer that likes how you did the car or executed the R group or whatever. To the build. We, which yeah, is the build. kind of the perennial hot rod problem because what you wanted in a car isn't necessarily what the market wants in a car. Exactly. Um, but the other part of that and what I just wanted to get back to was uh, your point that uh, bringing younger people in, bringing a new group of people in is the most important thing that we can do as, as car owners yeah. and you kind right. of pass on the legacy or pass on you know, you know, the romance or, or whatever it is. And sometimes that's by passing on the really <laughs> crappy cars that can't, no one can afford to restore anymore because they have rust problems or, you know, these are uh, non-original motors cars, no chance of having its that's original right. parts back. It's a great reuse to make these into what the Porsche community calls hot, uh, outlaws and what the rest of us call hot rods. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think also in the early 911, because of the value increase, I think that's why the 912 
now we're finally seeing it's being appreciated because a lot of people got pushed out of the early 911 market okay. and got into a 912 and said, wow, this is a great car. It's torquey. It's fun to drive. It's great value. Yeah, and that's something that actually we probably didn't pay enough attention to in the presentation is the, the 912 market. I think um, Dave and I had this yeah. conversation a long Absolutely. time ago <laughs> before the, 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 the real run-up in prices where we looked at, at early 912s, yeah. particularly the pre-1969 uh, cars, and said, you know what, there are a lot of things in here that are reminiscent of 356s. This really, in a lot of ways, is a 356D. <laughs> and it seems like as soon as we had that conversation, 912 prices yeah. started to go up. Rob and I were both in, uh, in L.A., uh, what, uh, November, December yeah. of this year, and we went to a dealership and saw two 912s there. And both of us, unfortunately, I don't think either one of us were in a position to buy a car right then. Yeah. But both of us were having real justification problems, leaving without at least test driving and, and thinking of yeah. ways we could, uh, you know, get a loan on these 912s because, you know, they're really fantastic cars. And once again, they get denigrated because they're not 911s. Well, you know, for the rest of us who, you know, maybe can't afford it or don't want to afford it, uh, a 912 has is, is always been a good choice. Well, I never thought I would see 912s, and I mean. Excellent examples sell for fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the market is for mm -hmm. an ex outstanding nine twelve. Rob, we should have bought that car. It was thirty six yeah. grand. It wasn't. It was very nice. <laughs> yeah. So was, you uh, pull the trigger I, when you see it, right? I was at uh, Will Hoyt's uh, just recently, a couple uh, last week, and uh, he was showing a nine twelve that uh, the owner had spent forty thousand dollars on the engine alone. Oh. And I don't know how much he spent on the restoration, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, we're going to shift our focus from uh, kind of a global perspective and an index perspective, and we're going to put Cam here in the driver's seat, and we're going to listen to his sort of buy, sell, and hold uh, opinions for kind of what the current market is doing. So, Cam, your, your current buy is, well, a variety of things. You, uh, you can't make a decision just like me, yeah. it seems like, but uh, let's hone in a little bit on kind of what you're, you're looking at here. Uh, yeah, I went with the whole uh, Ren Sport cars. Uh, it's an obvious choice from uh, 67 with the R all the way up to the last of the air-cooled 993 RS. And uh, I think there's two divergents that are really important in the, the 911 mark would be the Ren Sport cars, RS, and the normal normally aspirated cars, and then the turbocharged cars. Mm -hmm. Those are two kind of divergents that are really important for the mark. Um, we all know what the prices are for 73 RSs. We have touring cars, a Series mm -hmm. 2 and 3 cars that are selling for 400000 which is amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and those are for solid examples, but touring cars, not lightweights. And then in many instances, lightweights are in the 700000 range now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I think any of these cars, I think some of the, none of these cars are sleepers, by the way. You're not going to get sneak up on any one of these cars and get a deal. But I think, as I know many collectors, there's about 10 collectors I know that are Porsche-centric that are focusing on the Ren Sport cars. Okay. And they want to build RS collections. And I think there is so much synergy in these cars that mm -hmm. even, a, you know, if you can find a 964 RS, which is one of my favorite cars, they were never brought to the United States, but you can bring them into the United States. You can either um, federalize them or get them here on a show and display, mm -hmm. or the 993 RS. I think the 993 RS, particularly in a 95, you can bring into the country, which we just have recently mm -hmm. with an example. I was in high school when that car came out, and I lusted after it. That's all I wanted. I think there's going to be a whole generation of gentlemen like myself mm -hmm. who want that car particularly. I think I had that poster too. You yeah, know, the, right. cup, the cup car. You yep. know, with the, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. All right, so it, it's a little bit challenging. After you buy all this stuff, you have to make room in the garage. And so to sell something, you've got a few uh, recommendations. Uh, you know, I think as the 911 market, it's never been as educated as it is right now. Okay. There's so much information, including Haggerty's reports. Um, depending where you're looking, there's so much information, and everyone in this room knows what to look for. It's uh, mm -hmm. cars with history, with documentation, with providence, records going back, service records. I think if you have a, uh, any kind of 911 that's had serious paintwork or modifications, 
and no history, it's a real detriment. Uh, you, you'd want to sell that car and upgrade to something possibly. So being more critical of the collection and the quality, the integrity, and for its future appreciation? Yes. And such? Okay. And that's just in a collector. If you want to just enjoy a 911, obviously there's many instances. I still think a 964 is a great car to buy. That mm -hmm. used to be the buy-in model. And now if you just want to enjoy a 911, I think... A 996 GT3 oh, yeah. is one of the biggest values on the market. You can buy one for $50,000. A GT3 mm -hmm. 996, that's an amazing car. It's uh, one of the sleepers, I think. Okay. Ooh, that's a tough note for everybody right yeah. there. <laughs> I'm writing it down, too. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. So some of the things that uh, Cam recommends to hold on to. What do you uh, think yeah, here? The, uh, you know, any original, and this transcends going up to the G50 cars, the late 80 cars, any original paint car mm -hmm. is a fantastic buy. I think people are finally appreciating, and I think Rob would chip in on this, yeah. that original cars are where it's at. Yeah, and much, much rarer to find a, a long hood car with its original paint or any pre-galvanized uh, Porsche 911 with its original paint because obviously these cars were pretty much championship rusters. That's right. And, and you know, once you get out of, of Southern California and Nevada, you know, people have had to repaint cars to, to deal with rust issues over the years. So finding an early, a long hood car with its original paint intact and, and, and well preserved, very rare. Less so with the, the 1976 and later cars when they started galvanizing the bodies. Uh, a lot easier to find a, a three-liter Carrera or three-liter SC or 3.2-liter Carrera with its original paint, but you know, just it's the direction the hobby is going in, preserving originality. And the and the caveat to that would be also that uh, we all know, many in the room probably know how expensive a 356 restoration is. Even if you're buying all reproduction parts, it's very ex expensive. Mm -hmm. If you try to do an early 911, they have become there. It's not cheap. Mm -hmm. Even if you're using Stoddard or reproduction parts, it's very expensive. Have they so. reached that unobtainium status yet, or can we still work no, with you I mean, and find uh, stuff? Early 911 parts are just as expensive as if you're trying to find 4-cam parts. It's, I mean, trying to find original fenders that fit right mm -hmm. or any kind of trim pieces for an early 911, it's very expensive. Yeah. Okay. You're going to pay a premium. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to put Rob in the hot seat, and he's got a couple of... Uh, distinct vehicles to hone in on and stuff. Rob, let's yeah. talk about your, your buying situation yeah. here. What's First next thing, for you? Cam and I were actually having a conversation before this started on where are the sleepers, and there aren't that many left in the Porsche world right now, but I think <laughs> that the 74 to 76 Euro 2.7 liter Carreras are, are definitely sleepers. The same 210 horsepower mechanically injected uh, engine as the, the very famous and very desirable 73 27RSs. Again, it's that long hood versus short hood thing. These are five mile an hour impact bumper cars, but in every other way, very, very similar to the 73 27RS, which is a $300,000 car at this point. I see these cars still in the, the 50 to 70,000 euro range. On a, on a pretty regular basis. So and, I think and Rob, let's look at this through the, the lens of, yeah. of 2013. You know, of all the manufacturers who had to put big bumpers on cars, Porsche is the one that absolutely got it right. They knocked uh, it out of the park. And, These are, and, yeah. And so you're sure if you're comparing it to a you know to a, a small bumper car. Um, you know, you might prefer it, but uh, you know these cars now look so organic in yeah. 2013. When you're looking back, you know you you really have to stop and say, wait, that's a big bumper car. That is a great point because mm -hmm. I mean we can all think of of the the people who didn't get it right. I mean, looking at a at a at a 1971 Mercedes 350 SL versus a 450 SL built a few years later, those large bumpers are really. Uh, detrimental, um, but Porsche really was very thoughtful about what they did, and they really knocked it out of the park. They're well integrated into the car, and they're they're very pretty. So it's a good point. The other point we should make with these cars is they are not to be confused with the U.S. versions of the Carrera built from uh, '74 to '76, uh, I believe. That's right. They yeah, smog choke. Yeah, cars. smog choke cars with just the the, the stock CIS injected. 911S engine. I think they put out about 160 horsepower. These were the full 210 horsepower cars. 
that's why they're 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 different. I like the early ones with the ducktails better than the cars with the the tea tray or the whale tail spoilers, but they're all great buys right now. Mm-hmm. Great, um, color, great color schemes too. It's yeah. A great color palette for those years. Yep, and and that's that's a, another great point with these cars is the colors really do matter. Some of the some of the lifesaver colors, the really bright colors, uh, light yellow, uh, signal orange, viper green, very common, lime green, very common in, in those years, mm-hmm. and they, they definitely bring a premium. Um, Cell, uh, Cam and I are in full agreement here. Um, you know, high mileage, no records, uh, 911 SCs and, and uh, 3.2 Carreras. Um, there are better cars out there for not much more money. Um, if you've got one of those, not a bad idea to, to maybe upgrade. That said, I'm not as obsessed with a lot of people over low miles because these are cars that if they're used regularly and properly maintained, can go 300,000 miles in between engine rebuilds. So also, the contrarian view of it is, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to be expensive in the, in the parts and service department, but uh, um, if you find one that's not all bad, uh, it's not a bad uh, no. weekend driver, and it'll last you a long time. I mean, yeah. it's a, everybody's propensity is to, to take these cars and throw them under the bus and say, you don't want them, you don't want them. Yeah. Well, that creates an opportunity for the guys who might be a little bit handy, might be, uh, you know, just want a car that they can drive only in the summer months, something like that. So, uh, you know, yeah. even, even the cars that we're saying sell, I don't think anybody feels like, you know, you have to go out and sell it tomorrow because it'll be worthless. It's just that it's not going to appreciate like some of the other cars. Yeah, another great point, Dave. I mean, the fact of the matter is the SCs in particular are among the last Porsches that that really you can maintain. Bulletproof. Yeah, uh, they're bulletproof, and you can you can do a lot of maintenance work on your own. Get a copy of 101 projects. Yeah, it's so probably 11. not good to wear your flight suit and all that <laughs> driving it. But uh, yeah. you know, uh, you know, you might be kind of branded as stuck in the 80s if you do that. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'll put on my members only jacket and take it out. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think the reverse of that as well as Rob and Dave and I were talking before the forum this morning is that. Uh, on top of a car that's maybe had a lot of work done to it, there's the, always that, and I'm sure people in the room have had this experience, where you buy the low mileage car and it's perfect, and then you have all this deferred maintenance right. that you're going to yeah. incur, and you're going to spend a fortune on top of the price you paid. Yeah, so. yeah. And the cars are made to be driven, and they're a lot happier when they're used on a regular basis. Uh, my last one, hold. Uh, early 930s, uh, particularly the 76 Turbo Carreras, um, very, very pure design. I'm still scratching my head over the fact that, that <laughs> these cars can still be bought in, in the, the high 30s and the mid 40s. I, I think it's absolutely dumbfounding right. that these cars are still as inexpensive as they are. I can't figure it out. I'm, I'm curious from Reed's perspective in terms of the service and um, maintenance ownership costs of Rob's selection here to hold a car like this. We can see the graph is pretty impressive. What's an ownership experience like with maintaining a car like this? If you get uh, the right car, uh, the maintenance actually is less than some of the later cars. Uh, is what I've found. Okay. If you get the wrong car, you're going to be stuck with a five or six thousand dollar bill almost instantly. So. Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll call you, you first. Some, <laughs> we'll have you do the inspection, right? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Very and good. Repairs. That, that's what's called paying the Porsche tax. <laughs> <laughs> I good. Stoddard I like put that. it very well <laughs> years ago. Uh, he said that uh, all Porsches cost the same in the end. <laughs> you pay it up front or as you go. It's that's just right. amortized it all. That's <laughs> a, I love it. Dave, we're going to go to you. I'm really curious about your perspectives down yeah, here. What I, I do we feel gonna... like a member of the Taliban because I'm going to bring up the fact that they made other cars other than 911. So, uh, uh, 928. Um, let's let's get some perspective on a 928. If it weren't for the fact that the mostly American market is so absorbed with 911s, there wouldn't be a 911 anymore because Porsche wanted to make the 928 the replacement for the 911. These cars were incredible incredibly solidly engineered. Uh, I will remind everyone that when you went to buy one, when new, they were more expensive than a 911. 
Um, these cars were built with a completely different philosophy, and that's why almost everyone hates them. Um, my thought is that the early uh, 928s, uh, something with the uh, with the op art, the Pasha interior, uh, kind of a period piece, kind of a time piece, a really cool car to look at. And you know, if you go back and maybe kind of through a, a Vaseline-covered lens, look at those cars and go, well, wait a minute. You know, if you go out through the, um, if you go out on a Concours field, some of the, thi the things on that car are going to be the things that 40 and 50 years from now, people are going to say, wow, they actually did that in that year? You know, they, they put that crazy interior in there? Yeah. They did all that, and I think that that's something to remember. I actually like the 928s from a drivability standpoint, I mean, in terms of my comfort level. Um, my best 928 story is a very good friend of mine bought one at a charity, a Goodwill, paid $500 for it. Uh, about three weeks later, took it to the car wash. Uh, the car wash scraped all the paint off of the side, and so uh, he, uh, the car wash paid him $950 to repaint the side, which he never did. Uh, <laughs> drove the car for three more years and sold it for $2,000. I mean, how can you beat that? So, uh, um, you know, uh, if the parts are very expensive. I mean, there's plenty of downsides, uh, you know, to the cars, and, and they're not really all that valuable, but I still say they're a great car. The other side of that is the very last of the 928s. Unfortunately, almost all of them are automatic transmissions, and now I get to say the other part of that. The next generation of drivers doesn't want manual cars. Automatic transmissions are something we need to rethink. See, it so um, no you know, board. when uh, we did a seminar yeah. not too long <laughs> ago, and we uh, were talking about Toyota Celicas, uh, the Supras, I mean, and mm -hmm. uh, almost all of them as well are automatics. But uh, really, I, I mean, ha every one of us here has probably read the story where somebody carjacked a car and got in and then couldn't get away because they didn't know how to drive a manual transmission. <laughs> you know, it's become a safety feature on cars now. So, uh, <laughs> so I, it, basically, I like the early 928s and the late 928s. Yeah. I, Dave, I 100% I agree with you on the 928s. I know four people right now looking for 78 928s with that op art posh interior. So to me, that's indicative of a market that's, that's on the move. Yeah, and, and a great collector car, maybe not a great everyday driver, but a great weekend car. And I, think, I think on the high end, on, for the water pumpers, I think a 924 GT or GTS is probably one of the most unappreciated cars in the blue chip Porsche market. Yeah. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just a special, special car. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. And so, yeah, Dave, you, we talked about Outlaws and our group cars, and I see here we're talking about modifying 930s. Is, I'm curious about your definition here and why a modified car Well, I'm, I'm not talking about in-period modifications so much as things that people have done to them, and this car has got uh, what we, you know, the, the photo of this car, if you can see it, is... Uh, it's got a lot of what we call automotive jewelry on it. <laughs> okay. um, it's overdone. And um, it, once again, we get to the point where the marketplace, and, and it's really funny because usually my theory is the frugal man spends the most. The guy who doesn't spend any money on a car is the guy who's going to, it's going to wind up costing him more in the <laughs> long run. That has not been true now with, the, you know, with, with basically the market loving, absolutely preserved cars. The people who didn't open their checkbooks except for maintenance. Uh, and didn't do a lot of things to their cars are the ones that are now reaping all the rewards. Uh, if you're going out looking for a 930, I think, Cam, you'd agree with me, you want the one that hasn't been played around with. Absolutely. And, you know, you see the big wheels, you see the whale tail, you see the slant nose that was put on because it was made in the plastics factory last week, <laughs> and you think this car has been abused, this car has been, you know, torn up, and this car... Uh, you know, it, it, you know, I like to call them the auction cars. For years and years and years, we saw these cars. They were always guards red. They were always, yeah. you know, at the same auction, and uh, you know, they really did get abused. And that's mm -hmm. the car you don't want. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, no. stay yeah. away from that. All right. And what are you holding in the garage here, Dave? Well, we've got the uh, low mileage uh, 87 to 89 3.2 liter 911s. Um, these are the Carreras with the G50 gearbox. We talked a little bit about the gearbox differences. Uh, they're probably the gearbox isn't as much of a, of a problem as, as some people think. So I would even, uh, after I put this out, back off a little bit on yeah. that. 
but uh, I like these cars. Uh, once again, this is a car we're talking about with records, a 3.2 liter, uh, 87, 89. Um, and I'm kind of a fan of the oddball colors too. I, you know, I like them when they when they're you know kind of um, champagne grape. Uh, I like them when they've got kind of the unusual things. Number one, you'll never lose them in the parking lot. And number two, your friends will think you're even odder than you are. So what's wrong with that? Yeah. That's a great point. The later you get in the 911 run, particularly the 3.2 liter cars, a lot of the really interesting colors were gone by then. But uh, to, to your point, uh, I was chasing a car in a color called Summer Yellow, which yeah. is kind of a dead ringer for... The early 70s. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Summer Yellow used to dance at one of the clubs by the year. <laughs> Not that Summer oh, Yellow. Okay, I'm sorry. I That's have no idea. <laughs> Probably had a slant nose. But uh, uh, <laughs> the car wound up selling the day it was listed for about 25 to 30% more than I, I, I thought it, it should have uh, sold for it simply because it was that desirable color. Yeah. Like a Mopar high impact color, something no, unique? I, it sort of it was um, it very similar to a color called light yellow from the early 70s that you see a lot of Carrera RSs in. I think it's it's you know basically the same color, but unusual to see those bright colors later in the the 911 model run. This was like a 1988 model, so mm -hmm. uh, the market responded to that. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to step over to Reed, and I'm deeply curious about some of Reed's comments and thoughts about his experience, his ownership past, and, and being kind of a hands-on guy. I like a, a first-hand approach to uh, being with the cars and knowing the intricacies of what, uh, what their ownership is like. So, Reed, let's talk about some of your, your buying vehicles here today. Well, the obvious, the Speedsters, the early 911s, and uh, race models, they're, they're sort of obvious choices if you're buying a car to, that you expect to appreciate mm -hmm. and, or have in your collection. Uh, there any other, other the, the interesting thing is within this, the, if you were buying them for um, uh, appreciation, the, the 1960-61 Porsches, 356s have appreciated percentage-wise mm -hmm. <laughs> more than uh, uh, some of the others. The others have put in bigger dollar figures, but yeah. for a long time people wouldn't buy the 6061, and they've really come on strong. Absolutely. You called out, it's the first time I heard racing models come from the panel group. Um, could you maybe... Uh, I'll dig in a little bit deeper on a specific racing model because I might, I'm, I'm kind of confusing a race car or is it a production car with racing attributes? Uh, generally speaking, you're talking about spiders, the okay. early, uh, the, the 906, the 908, uh, mm -hmm. and obviously the uh, 910s, 917s. That's what I'm thinking. Of. Okay. Although there were certain cars modified by the factory, sure. street-type cars, the uh, 911 RSs, 1973, 74, 3 liters, uh, they're all, you know, were I, I think, built by. I think yeah. Reed is uh, being modest because Reed was way ahead of the market curve and buying a lot of four cams. Yeah. And um, he's, he was buying them when they were somewhat affordable. Um, but I think if any of you have read uh, the new sports car market letter, there's an excellent article by Miles Collier talking about why Spiders are the way that the price where they're at as aluminum cars and 917s, because 917s hovered at the $2 million mark for a year, long time, and now, you know, one traded hands not too long ago for $15 million. And just like Spiders now, an average Spider that's a rebodied car or mismatching 4-cam motor it's a two and a half million dollar car, you know. Yeah. That's and and one thing that hasn't come up, and I, you know, so it's not the you know the gorilla in the room that we're not talking about. You know, one of the winningest heritages, if not the winningest winningest heritage across all kinds that's of right. races, uh, you know, belongs to Porsche. That's and right. so uh, you know that's how they sell cars. Yeah. Uh, you know, is based on that that winning heritage, and and you know their record is unmatched by any other manufacturer. And basically. as Dave and I were talking about before the forum, uh, we have a value displacement. Some guys that were consuming big dollar 250 Ferraris, all of a sudden the, the Porsche market's a deal. 
And for you know, a three million dollar spider, it's a deal compared to an eight to ten million dollar Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think in the first time we see non Porsche collectors, non Mark, for a while spiders were bought by Porsche collectors. Yeah. And now it's transcended that and we see other collectors looking at value appreciation. So it's definitely diversified a little bit. Yeah. And so, Reed, we were talking earlier this morning about some of our selections when we put this presentation together, and, and some of your thoughts have changed just because of how tight you are within the oh, market. Yeah. <laughs> the, so what are we going to update here? We yeah, on the sell side there, they should read the 74 through 77 911s. Uh, there are any number of reasons that they're uh, not terribly desirable cars. Uh, they're both short hood. They have major engine problems, uh, to put it mildly. So, so that was the uh, yeah. uh, the only Porsches that I can think of that I wouldn't buy. Yeah. So we're front end loading the ownership experience by acquiring one of these cars, is what right. you're saying? <laughs> one, Versus amortizing. One caveat there, though, is that a lot of these cars, the ones, the the, the engine problems that that we alluded to, are, are are really well documented, but a lot of these cars, after the engines have, have blown up, as they inevitably will by 75 or 80,000 miles, have had transplants from later 3-liter or 3.2-liter cars, and, and those can be not bad. Well, you know, I, I think you're hitting on a point again that, that I feel kind of strongly about. We're talking mostly about collector cars, appreciating yeah. cars, and not... Yeah. A car that you can get in and have a lot of fun with, yeah. drive on a regular basis. You, you can take, uh, particularly from 76 on, where they start putting the uh, full zinc coating on them, mm -hmm. uh, put the 3.0, the 3 liter or the 3.2 liter engine, and have a great driving car yeah. right. gotcha. at great expense. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. it won't be a collectible. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Let's talk about some of the things you want to hold in your garage. And I see here we're, we're definitely narrowing in on a niche. I know where you heart belongs. <laughs> well, the, the, the coupes are, are appreciating, but not if, the, you know, if, we're, if they're great drivers and, and a lot of fun, particularly when you get to the 64, 65 model coupes. Uh, I would hold anyone I had, you know, because it's going to go up. It's going probably increase at the six, seven, eight percent a year rate, which is better than anything else you can get. Or you can, and you can drive it and enjoy it while you're going. But the, the big caveat that that I would give is, I've seen over the last two or three years a lot of car dealers of caught on to the fact maybe the last four years that these cars are appreciating so they're going out and buying junk, junk. cars that should be thrown away and putting a back. paint job on them throwing upholstery in them and then putting them on the market as uh, at market prices really uh, and they're junk uh, they're, they're, they should, mm -hmm. uh, are not worth having we, we get cars in for inspections when you put them up they have uh, screwed in floorboards oh uh, uh, to to get them <laughs> saleable. Or one we had recently had a complete rear clip put on, all lap weld, uh, which is in a year or two the lap welds are going to start breaking loose. The the paint is going to start bubbling. Uh, so <laughs> I would be very very careful about buying any of these cars now without having someone who really knows them inspect them. Yeah. Would you classify that as a good driver now? <laughs> <laughs> a rolling restoration candidate, you know, just enjoy it and drive it, save your pennies? To, to piggyback on what Reed said, though, I think uh, the coupes, and particularly the sunroof coupes, uh, Tom Gale and I were talking earlier before the start of this forum, uh, the A cars are I'm fond of the A cars and even the pre-A's, but a sunroof A or a sunroof C or SC model doesn't get any better because I think you have the best of both worlds. One of, one, of, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that restoring a coupe is, uh, what, probably 90% as expensive as, exploring, oh. uh, 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 as restoring a spider exactly. or a, you know, a drop-top car of any, of any iteration, and you're not going to get the return. 
you know, potentially like you would on a, on a convertible car. So that's something to be very well aware of. Right. And, you know, I mean, I, we always give these warnings, <clears throat> but buy the best you can afford, uh, even if it means you can't get the 356 and you have to get the 912. Um, you know, if you can't afford a nice one, don't buy it, buy something else. Uh, because you're going to hate a bad car and you're going to love a great car. Uh, and it's really, really important to remember that. And that doesn't go just for Porsche, it goes for every car. Well said. Um, yeah. You know, because it, there's nothing like the satisfaction of driving down the road, you know, wind in your hair, I remember that. Uh, you know, all that, all that sort of stuff, um, uh, and and having a wonderful time, as opposed to spending Saturdays wrenching, uh, well you know, said. all summer long trying to repair the stuff that you know somebody else didn't do a good job on, or that you know needs to be done because of deferred maintenance. Yeah, mm -hmm. nobody's ever complained about paying too much for a great car. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. You just bought too early, right? Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. All right, we were going to open the floor. And uh, ask the audience for some, some questions, some insights. We're going to have a microphone uh, wandering around, and we'll uh, head over to you real quick. Uh, how long have you been doing Los Angeles? How long have you been doing the Haggerty I started the project in 2004. I started it as uh, Cars That Matter, and I, uh, I actually uh, combined with Haggerty three years ago. So uh, actually the first printed edition was uh, August of 2006. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice job. Um, that's my brother-in-law over there. I want you. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. No, thank you very much. It's a. It's very hard to keep current on the markets, and and I, uh, you know, it's it's. Uh, my wife will will tell anyone here that the hours that we spend uh, on telephone doing the research. I actually have a full-time person now working in my office who does nothing but automotive research. Uh, you know, getting the background story on a number of cars. And we miss them every once in a while. You can't be perfect on everything, but we pride ourselves on being the best one out there. So I thank you very much. Take into consideration a lot more private sales than yeah, the other folks have. And they've become, actually, they're moving a little bit in the last year or so, but it's like a stubborn thing where they don't, I mean, Carreras, for God's sakes. I mean, you look at their price guide, and they're, three years behind. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. And we, you know, one thing I will tell you that is, as Haggerty now and working with Haggerty, I do get the numbers on the buy sell and the side and the uh, and the sell side. Don't get all freaked out. I don't get names attached to them. <laughs> I just get the numbers, and so I can take a look at what's coming through Haggerty's database as well. And uh, that's been very, very valuable. But, uh, you know, I'm going to, my new best friend Cam here is going to uh, tell me about some of the private sales that he knows about as well. And that's how we do it. We do it by growing organically. We talk to dealers, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's funny because uh, I have the dealers I can trust. Believe it or not, they're out there. Um, and I have the dealers who I know have an agenda, and I'm pretty good at finding out who they are. And so... But thank you very much. Appreciate it. I, I think that comment's really appropriate because I think Dave and Rob and Haggerty in general are really making an honest attempt to look at private sales. And private sales are what drive the market. I mean, we see what's in public, but it's the cars that are so good that it's a two phone call situation. They'll never go to they'll auction. Never hit, they'll never yep. hit the auction block. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Because there's five guys lined up to buy those cars. Exactly. We have another question from Jamie. Um, 59 356 cab, uh, virtually perfect, top and bottom, looks great, salvage title. What happens to the value of a really nice car when you're looking at a salvage title? Is it a 50% of value? Is it 20% of value? And this car is really good. You know, it's, it actually, I, I don't mean that anybody else can join in here. It's a marketing question. Um, if you, uh, you know, I, a friend of mine owns a, a three-year-old now Acura, and um, they bought it in Toronto. They live in Canada, and the ex-wife of the guy took a knife to every seat in the car and put an X through it. And that was a $25,000 replacement to put a new interior in an Acura. 
So he's driving a car with now an ex-wife um, and um, a, you know a very vicious and mad person. But anyhow, uh, the, his car got uh, salvage title because of that. And or I'm sorry, he bought the car because of the salvage title. So you have to go behind the reason why it was salvaged. Was the car uh, basically were fish swimming around it for three and a half years because it was in the you know the East River or something like that, or did it have you know, kind of an explainable thing. I own two cars with salvage titles. They were both uh, ex-race cars. They were brought back into the country by the manufacturer, and they wouldn't do anything but put a uh, salvage title on them because they didn't want the responsibility for that. But there was never any accident involved in it. So that's one thing. The other thing is, <clears throat> pardon me, and like I said, it's about the marketing. If you can, if you have a reasonable explanation, it might be only a 20% hit or a 0% hit. But if this car... <clears throat> um, you know, was involved in a major accident, and it's a newer car, that's a big deal. Yeah. With the older cars, I think it goes that's down every single yeah. year GT3 because a re-restored <laughs> car done by a quality restorer is just as good as uh, yeah. Yeah. a brand new car in many ways and sometimes even a little bit better because of what people can do in 2013 yeah. that they weren't doing in, in 1959 or 1960. Weigh in on that too briefly. I mean, I'd run away from a, a GT3 with a salvage title, but, you know, if that car acquired its salvage title in 1971, it may have been a $2,500 car then and a fender bender, you know, makes that car uh, a total loss. So, you know, look, as Dave said, looking back into the reasons for it, when it happened and everything else, you know, if it passes a pre-purchase inspection from somebody like Cam or Reed, mm -hmm. to me, it's 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 a it's it's a zero percent knock. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But they put new fronts on old rears and and uh, those cars, uh, even though you know they're they're you know they have to validate chassis numbers and so forth, the, the value of those cars hasn't been hurt at all. I think the Porsche market in general, when you look at 356s, and particularly a 59A cab, which is a desirable example, I think if you have pictures of the work completed, you know, how was the restoration work completed? You have more than ever people are asking for bare metal pictures of a car, and they want to see evidence of how the car was restored and to what level. So I think that can mitigate any kind of Every 350, I mean, there's so many title issues when you buy older 911s, whether titles have been skipped or it's not, the car's not registered, whatever it is. But I think it's circumstantial to Dave and Rob's point mm -hmm. to what, what the issue with the car is. And it could be totally not an issue at all. It, it's your job to make it an honest car is what That's it comes right. down to. That's exactly and, right. And, um, and, 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 you know, to, to make sure the story is absolutely out there. This That's car right. has a salvage title, and this is the reason why. And the next thoughtful and careful owner will understand that and will be fine mm -hmm. and should be fine with it. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same. You know, we're working in two different worlds. You don't want a one-year-old Mercedes with a salvage title, most likely, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if it was because somebody cut up the leather right. seat, something like that, unless yeah. you can buy it for an outrageous bargain. But for older cars, remanufactured, basically, it shouldn't be that big a deal. And I, I think that uh, there was a movement afoot not too long ago to make the salvage go away after 25 years, which I, I think is not a bad idea mm -hmm. as long as there's an explanation as to the reason why, or 30 years or 50 years, something like that. That's I mean, I, you know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, realistically, so many of the cars that we're looking at, you know, today and on the field, let's say, uh, are going to have, uh, you know, a, an unusually bad history. At some all these cars are old. They all have histories. I think to Reed's point, talking earlier about looking at car, I inspect a lot of early cars, and I see a lot of cars with screwed in chassis pans, lap welds. I mean. The market is so high for these cars, it's a buyer beware situation no, and, sell, you, and seller beware situation. Are you saying that the 356 didn't come with a fiberglass four or five? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. That was the lightweight edition? No, of course. Yeah. We're going to go to Tabitha over here. Dave. Try it again. It's okay. The sound guy's watching you. Yeah. Dave, can you give us some idea as to how you weight the various factors uh, that go into your price guide? 
private treaty versus public auctions versus dealers, et cetera? I'd love to tell you there is a formula, but there isn't. There's a lot of, actually, when it gets right down to it, you know, doing this and, and, and holding your finger up to the wind and seeing which way the wind blows. Uh, it's different for different cars. Um, you know, a lot of the times the value factor on one car can be something, you know, just so totally related to the options of the car. Uh, whereas other cars, it's going to be about the horsepower of the engine, you know, all those sort of things. So you can't do a Corvette like you can do a Corvair is what it comes down to because there's kind of a different market and a different ownership. Now, in terms of the, um, you know, the, the auction values, dealer values, reported values we get at Haggerty, and the stuff that I'm just able to kind of organically get on my own, I'd say that I go uh, the highest with the stuff I get on my own when I'm talking to, you know, trusted owners, trusted dealers. And like I said, I have people call me all the time, and I know what their agenda is most of the time, or I can find out what it is. And as long as somebody calls me and said, hey, I want to make a market in 356 C's because I think they're not valuable enough, and here are a couple of cars that have sold. I have a guy who does it with an Italian car, a very small make Italian car, and every time one of them moves, he sends me the information, and he thinks his car's worth 75000 and that just went in the new book at 57000 and that's where it's going to stay until I get more information. So it's, it's a weighted thing. Do you maintain a, a perpetual database by mark, by model, from auctions? Yeah, we, 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 you know, I, I go to most all of the big auctions and some of the small ones, so yeah, we do have a great database of stuff. That's what, basically, I'll wind that back to what, that's what Adam is in charge of with, with, the, with the Hegarty Institute. We probably have more information right now, and it grows every single day, than any other organization in terms of where the sales prices have been, where things have been through auctions. We're tracking cars by serial numbers when we can. And uh, you know, finding out where the you know where the kind of difference is, and also where things are going. And we like to to try very very hard to you know to talk about where things are going. And and one of the things that we've been talking about recently, frankly, has been where's the bubble? Where's the next bubble coming in? So mm -hmm. it's yeah. all stuff that we're uh, you know that we're kind of trying to stay on top of. Right. Thank you. You mean you don't keep it all in your head, Dave? <laughs> I'd like, like to say I could, but I can't. <laughs> We, uh, you've noticed the cameras in the room, and we are streaming, streaming today's presentation online, and it will be available online after today so you can share it. But as a result of that streaming, we have an Internet question, and I'll turn to Jamie over here and Claire. Um, Jeff on the web would like to know the typical price difference between a coupe and a Targa. Oh, Ooh, good Ooh, question. Wow. Yeah. Reed, do you have any thoughts? No, what? I didn't understand the question. The price difference between a coupe and a Targa. Desirability price difference coupe versus Targa. About that the Targa yeah, seem to be harder to sell than the coupe. Uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. A lot have to do with the wind noise, the the cost of the seals, the cost of the Targa top to repair. I would prefer the coupe, and I usually see the coupe uh, in equivalent condition. Uh, the the coupe goes for a little more than the Targa, is my experience. I also think, Cam? you know, one of the hottest cars right now on the market is a soft window soft 67S window. Yeah. Targa. Oh, yeah. And um, it, for all the reasons why, but uh, I think Targas were long appreciated for those reasons that we get provided, but I think they're on the move. Even a late 80s Targa is, a, is becoming desirable, a, a G50 Targa. Mm -hmm. uh, so but and, that's and debatable. I think it's a 15% deduction or increase depending on the value of the car. Sure. And Rob, uh, you and I have talked about this a thousand times, how that changes over time. You want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, it really does. I mean, I, I sold a very nice SC target to buy a sunroof cube for, for some of the reasons that Reed talked about. I mean, they, you know, no matter what the condition of the seals is, yeah. they're noisier, they do leak air, they do leak some water. Uh, the design, to a lot of people's eyes, is, is somewhat compromised versus the coupe. Um, I, my preference is a, is a sunroof coupe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we'd all agree to that yeah. up here. 
Yeah. And plus, you know, the uh, serious. I, I I would take a Targa. I, I, absolutely. Well, number one, uh, I'd be driving it with the yes, I'd be driving it with put the, a uh, with the top off the entire time, <laughs> and it would sit in my garage all winter under a cover with the top off, most likely. Yeah, so, uh-huh. but uh, you know, it's it's why they make vanilla and chocolate. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it you know, that's, I, I think it's but, true. Uh, but but I understand why the coupe car is going to be worth more probably in the long run. But a sunroof car is almost undrivable for me. Cool car is a 912 Targa. That's a very cool car. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Tabitha's in the front here with a question. Uh, appreciate your gentleman's uh, putting your look into the crystal ball <laughs> around the long-term potential for the nine, three, nice 356s and the early 911s. Uh, <laughs> given, if you look around inside the communities of interest in those cars, the demographics of the people who are owning them and buying them, they're in their 50s and 60s now. Uh, and if you think about the younger folks coming up, uh, will the demand be there 20, 30 years from now, the long term now? Yeah. Or will these cars go through a, a period of kind of like a, a winter uh, as there's a transition from the enthusiasts of today right. to the enthusiasts of tomorrow? It's, it's yeah. a great question, Chip. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things are going to happen. We've seen demographic shifts in the hobby before, particularly the pre-war car market, where the, the World War II generation, for whom those cars were the aspirational cars of their youth, sort of passed in the scene, and, and there was a lull with those things for a while. And then younger people started to look at them and say, you know what, these are really objects of art. I didn't really necessarily want a V16 Cadillac or a V12 Packard when I was growing up, but these are really art objects and I want to have one in my collection. So instead of going behind velvet ropes forever and, and not being seen nor heard from again, they got popular. I think the same thing will happen with, with Porsches. I think that 911s and 356s like E-types and other iconic cars are always going to be cool no matter what your age is. And the fact is the 911 is still around, so I think that's always going to spur interest in the earlier cars. That said, I think younger people are going to be looking at cars like 968s, um, a car that we haven't talked about at all today, mm-hmm. the last uh, development of the, the 944. Wonderful cars, far more numerous in, in cabriolets than coupes. I might add a really nice low mileage 968 to, to, to my collection. I think that's, that's what we didn't talk about earlier, but it might be a buy. I think generational collecting, because I just was at a symposium that talked about this, the Miles Collier Symposium, a few people in the room were there. It's an interesting question. I think Porsche as a brand, just like Ferrari as a brand, makes such incredible pro- products that we're getting, every decade we're getting new collectors into the Porsche market because they buy a brand new car and they start reading a book and then they go to an auction, which we've all seen at David at Goodings or RM, and you see a father and son buy a Speedster for now $250,000. That's the average going price. And they've never owned a 356, and they bought it at, at, at an auction. Mm-hmm. And so I think uh, the iconic 356s are always going to be strong. The Carreras, the Speedsters, the Open Top uh, Roadsters. Um, I don't see a real issue with that because of the, the, the strength of the brand and how good it is and how they're going to always pull in with the Ren Sports. They're talking about it at Ren Sport for 2015. I mean, if you've ever been to that event, that's one of the best events in the world. And I think that passion is going to continue to be revitalized with each subsequent generation going forward. Uh, two words, event eligibility. Why is a 1905 Cadillac worth half of a 1904 Cadillac? It's because the 1904 Cadillac can go on the London to Brighton one. Right. Run one race, yeah. uh, lasts all day, 60 miles uh, in November in the UK. Uh, you can't buy a 2000. I'm sorry, a 1904 Cadillac for under 60, 70 thousand mm-hmm. dollars, but you can find one for half that for a 1905 because it's not eligible for the race. And I think that's something we have to remember on every single car. It has, they have to be avel- eligible for events, whether they're show events, whether they're driving events, whether they're casual fun yeah. events, whether they're rallies, yeah. whatever they are. If you have a car that's mm-hmm. going, uh, going nowhere in terms of value 
and you're wondering what to do with it, you own, you know, 50s Cadillacs or something like that, you better put together a 50 Cadillac caravan or something like that right. to have people involved in it. Because when people are involved in their automobiles, the value stays the same or goes up. When there's no interest anymore and people don't want them, they start going down. Yeah, to your point, a 356 is your ticket into uh, the California Mille Mille, the Colorado Grand. If you want to drive a speed, it's your ticket in at a very affordable buy-in compared to what else is on those kind of events. Absolutely. And dependable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Without a doubt. Um, Jamie has a question here in the middle. I have a 1963 356B that I might be interested in the near future in selling. Oh, they're totally worthless. Talk to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, you talk about this private market that um, is out there somewhere, and I'm interested in uh, where are places that I can advertise to perhaps tap that market as opposed mm -hmm. to simply taking it to auction. I think, uh, you know, Rob's point, um, your point of panorama, and I think, um, I think it's universal truth that eBay has changed the collector car world. And all you want to do, eBay is a global audience, and I think what I would stress is when you, if you do a listing on eBay, is make sure you have a, a professional look at your write-up and description of the car and have really good photos of the chassis of the car and particular areas of rust, of concern. Because the better write-up you have, you're going to mitigate the dumb questions on eBay and your phone ringing off the hook. Mm -hmm. And I think if you talk to an expert or someone who's really current with the value prices, they can give you an expectation value range. And I think that I mean, eBay has just changed the world, the way we look at cars. You can go on eBay and look for and get a general price guide uh, for particular models. Well, the way to access that market is to is to take your car to you know either one of these gentlemen in the middle here or something like that and have them assess the car. And good cars get sold just like uh, just like you said here just a minute ago with a phone call, um, and they get sold for a very very good price. Whereas you know some of the other cars you know can go waiting. In terms of eBay, it it is kind of a universal leveler. I mean, everyone here will raise a hand with a with a, a horrific eBay story about a horribly misrepresented car. Never, ever, ever when you're selling a car misrepresented. If it's a bad car, write funny stuff. If it's a really bad car, hire a comedian. Um, but in the meantime, you want to tell the whole story. And just like you said, or you're going to be on your cell phone. 24 hours a day, asking, answering ridiculous questions about, you know, whether they use the, uh, you know, the square, uh, square tube nuts or the round tube nuts on, you know, the air cleaner yeah. or whatever. So very Easy good. Enough. I think we have time for one more question with Tabitha, and then we'll have to adjourn. Hi, uh, my name is Ezekiel. I work with European Car Magazine, and one of the trends that we've been noticing to kind of go off of the younger generations trying to get into this market is the line being blurred with outlaw your um, urban outlaw cars and hot rotted and stripped down and even cars like singer who are taking 964s and building these one-off cars and using components from new technology and old cars what's the value going to be or how is it going to affect the market since the cars those particular cars who rank really high on the market, what's it going to be in the future? Is, is because the line will be blurred at some point between prestigious kind of original and new modern, uh, you know, hot rod versions. Good question. I mean, it's, it's all going to come down to the, the provenance of, of, of who built the car. I mean, yeah. the roof cars... Uh, from the 80s have held up very well. Singer has a great name. So I think those cars will, will hold up well. If they were cars that were uh, done and built by, by, uh, by somebody with, without a name, they're not going to do so well in the future. But the, the thing to keep in mind is, is everything is cyclical. When I first started buying Long Hood 911s in the, the early 1980s, everybody wanted to update them to make them look like SCs. They blacked out the trim. The door handles, they put those little reflectors that, uh, that, that bridge the gap between the taillights and everything else. And, I, you know, I think that, it, that at some point 
um, you know, the cars that people are backdating now, you know, people are going to want that, you know, the, the look of the blacked out trim and, and everything else. So it's, it's, you know, everything is cyclical and everything comes back into fashion at some point. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I think the Singer cars are one of the coolest things on the market. Um, you know, and they, they've made six of them for six individual collectors, and neither none of those guys are going to sell those cars, and they're beautiful. They're absolutely the the quality and the attention to detail in those cars are amazing. Uh, talking with Magnus last night, the Urban Outlaw, he has offers all the time to buy his cars from collectors, sure. and uh, he's he's at the point where he's designing his own cars and they have some value because of the cachet that he does those cars and he does 1200 miles on them after he finishes them so they're mm-hmm. sorted cars they're assorted R group cars and i think i think the line is already being blurred to answer your question but i think R or outlaw type cars will always have a diminished value compared to the truly collectible cars, obviously. I like it. I like it. We need to close with that final answer from Cam. I appreciate everyone's attendance and great (laughs) questions today. Our panelists will be in the back of the room if you have any further questions. And thanks for joining us, and have enjoy the rest of your day.